How's everybody doing? Awesome. Well, my name is Derek, and I lead our church here at Lake Spring, so glad uh, you're here today. If you have your Bible, let's open it up to 1 Kings chapter 19. All right, 1 Kings chapter 19. And uh, we're starting a series today on a practice called solitude. Um, it's one of the spiritual practices of Jesus and one of the practices in which uh, we as a church will try and practice together uh, in order that God might uh, make us and help us and form in us uh, the image of Christ for the sake of others. Now, I say that because I think that's really important that we say it in those ways that, that what we really hope to see happen through practices like this and through spiritual formation practice is that God would help form and shape us into the image of Christ for the sake of other people. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we, we believe that um, as God takes us and as he shapes us and molds us to look more like Christ, because in Christ came the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven, that we can make the world a more Eden-like place through our transformed self. Does that make sense? And so as we become more formed to the image of Christ, we make the world a more Eden-like place, which is for the sake of others. And if, if we talk about spiritual formation in some sort of other category, some sort of other form of where we say like, oh, we're doing this and because, I, because I really need to get better at this or I really need to get better at that. And it's just some form of self-help. Um, it's, it's not Christian formation. Christian formation is, is specifically geared toward us loving God more and loving others more. Um, and so if the formation we are undergoing does not lead us to love God more or love others more, it is not Christian formation. Uh, and so, um, so we just need to be aware that that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this idea behind Christian formation because there is a type of discipleship that can leave you um, unchanged. Did you guys know this? There's a type of religious observance and a type of adherence to uh, spirituality and religion that you will not be transformed. Uh, you can go to church your whole life, read your Bible, pray, do all of those things, and remain unchanged for the most part, uh, which is scary to think about, to be quite honest, but is absolutely um, true. And uh, in a lot of cases, this is because a lot of our discipleship stems from this idea that we need to pursue knowledge and, and right understanding of theology that makes us right and able to uh, discern the difference between uh, the, the right things to do and the bad things to do and, and creating some sort of us moral behavior. And all of that is good and all of that is important, but all of that I do not think is ultimate or what Jesus is most important about or, or most, uh, um, I guess, fixed on uh, trying to make happen. That, that he's, not, he's not as concerned about your theology and your doctrine as he is. Are you actually being formed to the image of Christ? And, and are you bringing the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven? So whether or not you have the right ideas about God or thoughts about God or the right standing in a lot of different ways, I don't think is nearly as important to him as some other things. Uh, Dallas Willard says, it's hard to be right and not hurt anyone with it. It's hard to be right and not hurt anyone with it. And a lot of times um, what we see people who dive into deep spiritual practice is, is they do it in order to be right and to tell other people that they're wrong. And that's not the grace-filled nature of Christ. Um, it makes us less like Christ, actually. What, what Jesus is after is an intimate relationship with us and, and us have an intimate relationship with him where, where uh, we know him in a biblical way. Uh, to explain what I mean by know in a biblical way, let me, just, let me just show you this verse from Genesis chapter 4. All right, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. All right, I don't think I have to do a whole lot of deductive reasoning uh, behind what the word knew meant in that, in that verse, do I? Uh, so uh, anyway, it's, it's the Hebrew word yada. Uh, in case you don't know, it's yada. Uh, men, if you're ever wanting to call your wife to bed one night, you can always just say yada, and maybe she will respond favorably. I don't know. Um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you've ever watched Seinfeld, there's that yada yada episode. It reminds me so much of that. And uh, so anyway... 
But the idea is to know in an intimate way, to have an intimate knowledge of one another. That's kind of the idea here, and that's the idea of us knowing God as well. It's the same word used in Psalm 46.10, where he says, Be still and know that I am God. It's the same word, Yada. It's the same idea that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 7, when he says you can do all of these things. There are going to be people who come to him and go, well, didn't we say this? And didn't we do this? And didn't we say this and do this in your name? And he's going to say, yeah, but I never knew you. I never knew you. Didn't have an intimate knowledge. Um, this, is, this is striking, right? Just by these few examples that, that, the, that, that the relationship we have with Jesus is the most powerful and important thing we can give ourselves to. And that's why solitude is such an important practice because our knowledge of God has to go beyond some sort of theological framework. It has to go into a personal, deep, intimate knowledge. Um, and I, I say all this because, to be honest, um, a lot of the, the practices that we engage in and that we work in towards spiritual formation are deeply personal to me. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, our church does these things is because they're so deeply personal to me. Um, for a really, really long time, I worked really, really hard to make sure I was always right and that I had the right theology uh, so I could stand up here and I could teach the Bible and all those kinds of things. And, um, and I tried to do all the right stuff in order to help people come to know Jesus and and to become Christians. There's a lot of good heart behind what I was doing, but there wasn't much of a relationship with Jesus in the midst of all of that good intention. And, um, and I, I looked like a lot of successful pastors. I looked like a lot of successful ministers uh, and church leaders. I didn't uh, look a whole lot like Jesus, though. And, uh, and it was a time for me in quiet solitude out in the woods in the middle of nowhere in eastern North Carolina uh, where I kind of realized I was creating an environment where the church could grow um, and, and yet I could remain unchanged. And the spirit uh, and the fruit of the spirit could remain uncultivated and ungrown in my life, that I could be void of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. I could be void of these things and still have a successful ministry. And it, and it ripped me to my knees to the point that I was like, this, this isn't going to happen. I'm not going to let this happen. And, uh, and I, I, I should, I'll just I'll speak for you in this, that you should all be grateful that I, as the leader of our church, found my way into this time of solitude. Uh, because had I not, um, it, it would not have, I would not be worth following, okay? Uh, it, it, because, th to be honest, um, I think people liked me a little more uh, that way, though. Like a couple years ago, a few years ago, when I was when I was less formed uh, in the image of Christ, and when the fruit of the Spirit was not growing as much as it is now in my life, I think people actually liked that Derek a little bit better because I was less challenging, I was less radical, um, I was uh, I was a little less um, abrasive at times, um, and um, and it was easier to engage. Uh, but, 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 that's, but that's not really possible anymore. There's something that happens. Uh, when the leader changes, everything around the leader must change, including the community around the leader. And that's not just true of a church, but that's true of your family as well. So you should know that if you give yourself to these practices, you give yourself to true life change to be formed in the image of Christ, you will change and that will demand that everything around you changes. Your marriage will change or have to change. Your children will change. The way you work and, and interact at work will change. All of it will change. Because when you're truly being changed into the image of Christ, everything changes around you. Everything changes around you. Now, um, here is a, a, a picture that I want us to play with, okay? Uh, as we kind of work through this idea of solitude. Uh, one of uh, the, the people that I sit under is a spiritual director by the name of Ruth Haley Barton. She leads uh, the Transforming Center 
in Chicago every three months I go uh, away on retreat and um, and Ruth leads those retreats and she does a great job but she tells a story of a time where she was working with her spiritual director and her spiritual director said to her uh, Ruth you're like a jar of shaken up river water you're like a jar of shaken up river water now you guys get the picture right it's like it's like this muddy murky water when it's all shaken up but when you put the jar on the table and just let it sit there all the sediment kinds of falls to the bottom and the the jar becomes clear and that is ultimately what solitude gives us the ability to do is it it gives us the ability to sit still long enough in the presence of god long enough that the sediment of our life might settle down to the bottom and life in our world might become a little bit more clear that we might be able to hear God's voice more clearly we might be able to experience him more deeply and so um so I think I think we can all resonate with this idea but I also think Elijah in first Kings 19 resonates with this pretty well so that's where we're gonna be the next few weeks we're gonna be looking at this story of Elijah in first Kings 19. Uh, if you don't know the story of Elijah, 1 Kings 19, let me give you some background, okay? In 1 Kings uh, 18, there is, this, um, there is this amazing story of what Elijah is, is encountering with God. He challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest, and he tells the prophets of Baal, like, why don't you call on your God uh, to rain fire down from heaven? I'll call on my God to rain fire down from heaven. We'll see which one wins, Right? Well, the prophets of Baal do all their things. They do the song and the dance and literally the song and the dance, like around the altar. It does not work. Like nothing happens. And Elijah starts telling jokes about how Baal's sitting on the toilet in the bathroom. And it's, if you don't think comedy is in the Bible, it's right there. Okay. So just go read it. Um, and, uh, and so, so he's, he's making fun of the prophets. He's making fun of Baal. And then he calls down from God and says, God, rain fire from heaven. And immediately God sends fire down from heaven on this water soaked altar that Elijah has prepared it's just this amazing amazing god went right i mean maybe unlike almost any other story it's like that is god showing up when you call on him right there right and then in first kings 19 something weird happens as you turn the page from 18 to 19 it's like what we're living in a different story now what just happened right let me show you what i mean first kings 19 verse 1 Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. All right, let's stop right there for just a second. So Jezebel is apparently a very scary woman, okay? Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't know, but like if you ever hear like she's a Jezebel, run, okay? Um, so this is where you get that term. Um, here's here's the idea. Um, she sends a letter to Elijah, and she says, "Look, I'm going, I'm coming for you. I'm coming after you. You get ready." And it's, it's really interesting to me because I'm a pretty bold person, all right? And I'm pretty confident as well. Um, and I'm too confident. Anyway, um, but like I've just, seen, I've just seen God rain fire down from heaven when I call on his name. And a woman sends a letter and says, I'm coming for you. I'm going to look at that woman and be like, okay, I'm putting bells on, coming outside, bring it. Let's go, you know? Like, I don't know about you, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna, like, I, I'm thinking I'm gonna win this fight. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, every time I'm thinking I'm gonna win this fight. But Elijah does something different. He does this. He says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Does anyone else think Elijah's a coward at this point? Like, am I the only one who reads this and I'm like, this dude's a chicken. All right, um... That's, that's the way I read it. It's okay to read the Bible that way, by the way. Um, when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. So notice he, he was traveling with a servant. He leaves him um, in Beersheba, and he went a day's journey into the wilderness. We talked about this a little bit last week, that the word in the, in the New Testament to describe the wilderness or the desolate place or the deserted place or the quiet place is the Eremos. And so you see Elijah's moving into the wilderness. He's moving into the Eremos. Uh, to be with God. And it says this, he came to a broom bush, sat under it and prayed that he might die. What is going on? Is anyone else like, what in the world is happening right now? 
Like you're reading this, you just heard about, and you've seen God do so many amazing things, and now you're running from your life from a, a crazed woman, and and you're going into the wilderness and just saying, God, like just take my life, just take it. I don't want to do this anymore. It's kind of crazy, right? Like I mean, it just doesn't seem like it's the same story. It says, this is what Elijah says. He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the, the bush and fell asleep. At once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up uh, and, and eat or the journey will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Now, this is a really fascinating story to me because, of, again, just kind of a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about. And, I, and, and there's, this, there's this idea in my head as I read this, like, I'm like, man, like, at first, I'm like, Elijah, you are just a scaredy cat wimp coward. That's what you are. And, and I'm kind of getting irritated, Elijah, at this. And then I start to hear him actually pour out his heart a little bit. And then I start to have a little bit of empathy and compassion for where he's at because, to be honest, I, I've never got to the point where, like, I'm like, God, like, just take my life, but I've definitely wanted to quit. Anyone else? Like, I, and, I, and I think that's what Elijah is really getting at is he's like, hey, if I have to keep doing this, you might as well just kill me because I would rather not do this anymore. I just want to quit. I just want to give up, right? And I don't know about you, but my guess is you can resonate with that. Like, you're just ready to be done. You're ready to quit. You're ready to give up, right? And what you realize as you go through this story is that Elijah's having a really hard time. The further and further you get, you realize he's struggling, struggling with, with his calling. He's struggling with his faith. He's struggling with his loneliness. He's struggling with, with depression, right? All things I think you and I can relate with fairly well. But what does God do for Elijah here? What does God do? Does he come and speak to him? Elijah, you know, does he like call him out of a burning bush or anything? No. Does he encourage him? He's like, hey, buddy, you're doing great. Keep it up. Does he give him some inspiring halftime speech? Like, hey, I know we're down right now, but we're going to come back. Does he remind him of his goodness? Don't you remember how good I've been to you? over and over and over again, remind him of that? Does he ream him? Does he call him a coward? <laughs> right? Does he point out his shortcomings? No. What does he do? You guys know? Do you, guys, you guys remember what it said? He let him sleep. Wait. Hold on. What? God just let him take a nap? Well, then what does he do? He feeds him some food. It's like, what? He just feeds him some food? He lets him take a nap and then feeds him some food? It's like, I don't know if you guys know this, but you will die if you don't sleep or you don't eat. So what is he doing? Elijah wants to die. What is he saying? I'm not going to let you die. I'm not going to let you die. But I'm going to give you what you most need, and what you most need right now is you need some sleep. And he needs some food. What does he do after he gives him food? He lets him sleep again. <laughs> now at this point, this is the point where I'm starting to question God, right? I was questioning Elijah at the beginning of the story. Now I'm starting to question God a little bit. I was like, well, what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do now, God? Like now's the time, right? You let him sleep now. He's going to wake up from his nap. Now's the time to give him the speech, right? What does he do? He gives him more food. At this point, I am like reading the story and I am absolutely so mad at God. Can I just be honest with you? Like, I'm so mad at God. I'm just like, God, why don't you deal with this guy's pain? Like, could you just like do something to make him feel better, please? Or if you're not gonna do that, call him a coward and get him motivated and back out in the field. Like, let's go. You know, like I want him to do something. And God's not doing anything. He's just letting him take a nap and feeding him a bunch of carbs. It's annoying. 
right? Anyone else feel this way? It's okay to feel this way, by the way, when you read the Bible. But here's the important thing that I don't think that we can miss is he's doing what's most important for Elijah. He may seem like he's being very passive right now, but he's actually being very active and he's actually to coming in and, and giving Elijah exactly what he needs. Because Elijah has come out to him. And I love how Elijah comes out to him. This is the invitation of solitude, by the way. He comes out to him with what is. Not what should be or what could be or what might be, but what is. He says, this is where I'm at, God. This is where I'm at. And God takes him as he is. Takes him as he is and gives him what he needs most. He's exhausted. He's tired. He's been working for years. Do you realize this? Years doing the work of the Lord. And ministry has gotten him absolutely beat to death. He is exhausted. He has nothing left in the tank. And he and he's looking for like God to just do away with all of it. And, and God just says, well, let me just give you some rest. Let me feed you some food. Let me take care of your limit, your, your, your limits. See, there's something um, really key in this um, is that God understands Elijah's humanity is a limitation. That he needs food. He needs sleep in order to continue to go. And the angel even says this. The second time he comes to feed Elijah, he says, he comes back to him the second time he feeds him. He gives him something to eat. And he says, eat this and drink this for the journey is too much for you. And truth be told, many of us, many of us, we would love to journey into deep places with God, wouldn't we? But if we were to go on that journey right now, it would be too much for us. We wouldn't get very far. Because a lot of us are tired and exhausted and we're running all the time I want you to think about this this is a rhetorical question so don't feel like you have to answer it out loud but how many of you when you feel times uh, that you're venturing in to be with God and you open up the Bible and you start to read and you just kind of start to doze off a little bit am I the only one okay what about when you pray you just kind of doze off a little bit, or maybe your mind just can't stop racing because you've been racing and you can't quiet your mind to be with God and be in his presence and let him speak to you or say something powerful to you. You've just been running hard and fast and you can't shut it off. How many of you, if you were being completely honest, would say that you don't even have time to be with God? Like, where would I do it? I'd have to wake up earlier and then I'm not getting the rest that I need, Derek, right? That's what you're talking about. Or to stay up later, which I don't have with all life's demands. I'm falling asleep when I'm staying up later trying to be with God. I don't have time. Where am I going to fit him in? Or maybe there's times with God that you're, you're venturing to be with God and you just, you're trying and you're trying and you're trying and you're just not getting anything out of it. Everybody have that experience? My guess is most of us in the room have those experiences all the time. Because we, we are trying to go and on a journey that we are not ready for. And that is too much for us. And we are not um, able to venture into and right now, if you're in that spot and you find yourself in that spot, you're a jar of shaken up river water. And what the invitation of solitude is, is not to like, hey, come away and let's study the Bible together. And hey, let's come away. And let's, let's spend a lot of time in prayer together. All of that stuff is great and it will come. It will come. But at first, we must just be still. Long enough to let the sediment settle. And let things become clear so we can hear and experience God in a deep and meaningful way. That's the beginning. That's where we have to start. So we need rest. And he's offering uh, a chance for rest in solitude or else the journey will be too much. 
Many of us enter into solitude. Many of us do this, right? We try and enter into quiet time. That's what we call it. Um, and we do it with a, some sort of spiritual agenda, don't we? A lot of the time. Like, I want to get this done. And I want to accomplish this. And God, I want you to say this. And I want, you know, we, we come in with an agenda and solitude is not about coming in with an agenda uh, to make us more spiritual, but uh, an agenda to make us more of who God wants us to be. And um, not that we might be able to do all the right things or know all the right things or say all the right things, but that we can just come and be with God as we are. And this is where we have to start. What we see with Elijah is that once God like gives him rest and restores his body, he can then restore his mind and his soul. But he can't do it until he deals with his human limitations. He can't go into deeper parts of the spirit uh, where he wants to go until he deals with Elijah's limitations as a human being. And so this is where I encourage us to start. It's in the same spot. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus, uh, he sends out his disciples. Uh, he sends out his disciples and says, go like into the world preaching and teaching the gospel. And uh, it's really a, a really cool kind of a scene. He gives authority to his disciples to go cast out demons. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And they are doing amazing things. They could never have done until they met Jesus, until Jesus had become a part of their life. They're doing amazing, amazing work. And it is just one of the most beautiful, beautiful scenes we see. They come back to Jesus. And when they come back, they find out that one of their really good friends, John the Baptist, has just been beheaded and killed. And so think about the disciples and where they're at. They're in this place of like, man, they're in like this amazing, amazing spiritual high. And then then they find themselves in this also kind of lull of a low of like someone close to us just died. And like they're in the midst of all of this. And there are people coming and going day in and day out, rushing from one thing to another. And, And they return home and they begin to tell Jesus about all the stuff that they've done. And this is, this is what Jesus says. And I want to I share this with you. But this is, this is the invitation. It's the invitation that you are given by Jesus that I think we need to accept and we need to, to grab a hold of um, as we go to practice solitude as a church. Because I think if we embrace this invitation, God will meet us there in a really powerful way. But it says this in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 31 says then, because so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Again, remember what they've been doing. They've been really busy doing the work of God. They're really excited about the work of God. They're also in the midst of this difficult situation, difficult trial. And Jesus says, come away with me by yourself and get some rest. Get some rest. Now, here's something that I can resonate with. I can resonate with moving so fast that it's hard to eat. I don't know about you guys, but my kids eat their breakfast every morning in my car because we run so fast. There are many days where it's like, oh, I just get through lunchtime and I'm like, I haven't eaten anything because I've just been working so hard been focused on other things there are many days where like when I do have a chance to eat I run out as fast as I can grab something and come back right in order time to make that next meeting or see that next thing take place running so fast that like I forget and I don't even have a chance to eat now here's the crazy thing is many of us when we get in seasons like that we go well this is just a season Well, this is just a season. Once the season's over, then I'll find time. Right? Don't don't we kind of have that mindset of like, whoa, well, once the season's over, then I'll have time. I think it's interesting Jesus doesn't say, hey, guys, by the way, this is just a season. While I'm here, everybody's going to want a piece of you. But once I die, no one's going to care about who you are. Right? He doesn't say that. What does he say? In the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the craziness, in the middle of running from one thing to another, he says, come away with me by yourself and get some rest. Get some rest. Many of us are waiting for a time when things slow down to be with Jesus. 
And he's saying, no, no, no. I want you to, I want you to say no to all of the fast stuff. I want you to put it on hold. Say no to it. Come away with me to a quiet place and get some rest. That's the invitation. Many of you will say, well, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't block off time on my calendar to do that. I have people that are depending on me. Employees and clients and all. I'm sorry, but you aren't the savior of the world. Can I say that? The savior of the world did not let everyone have access to him all of the time. Maybe you should also set some more boundaries. Here's the truth is that if you come in here today and you feel like life is really frantic, it's fast paced, it's busy, you jump from one thing to another, you run your kids from one activity to another, you're moving from the time the alarm goes off until your head hits the pillow at night, I want you to know the invitation is to come away with Jesus by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. If you're depressed and you feel like life is too much and you, can't just, you just can't keep going, that you're ready to give up, you're juggling all of life's demands, you feel like more of a machine than a human, Jesus' invitation is to come away to a quiet place with him and get some rest. If you're experiencing breakthroughs at work and in your personal life and everything seems like a God win, Everywhere you turn, God is just blessing you and doing amazing things, and you have such a good testimony to share. And well, you know, the invitation in that season is also to get away with Jesus into a quiet place and get some rest. Maybe you're dealing with the loss of a, of a, of a loved one or a close friend, or maybe you're dealing with the loss of a parent who's still alive, but they just they don't recognize you anymore. I want you to know, even in that season, Jesus' invitation is to come away with him to a quiet place by yourself and get some rest. Can we accept this invitation? Can we venture into solitude, into the Aramos to be with Jesus? If we do, I think he can change us and transform us in a way that not only gives and, 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 um, gives us rest for our body, but gives us rest for our mind and gives us rest for our souls for the sake of others. For the sake of others. But if we don't, if we don't accept the invitation, my guess is, like Elijah, this journey is going to be too much for us. The journey is going to be too much for us. So here's what I want to challenge you to this week. A few next steps uh, that I want to I challenge you to. Uh, the first one is get plenty of sleep. Get plenty of sleep. I think the average American right now sleeps on average about six and a half hours a night. Um, and uh, we need at least seven to nine hours of sleep. Right? We have human limitations. We need seven to nine hours of sleep. Take a nap every day. Take a nap every day. Here's, here's why I say that. Um, I, uh, I, I recently made a, made a friend, uh, his name's Bob Russell. He's 80 year old guy, retired minister, uh, from Louisville, Kentucky. And, uh, back in September, I got to spend about four days with Bob, uh, in Louisville. And it was a great four days. Um, never been around him before. Haven't ever really talked to him before. Uh, and, uh, and, we talked to Bob's assistants uh, or former assistants that worked for him at the church. We talked to his elders who worked with him at the church. We talked to his wife. Uh, and all of them said, you don't mess with Bob's nap. That was like the one rule. You don't mess with Bob's nap. And um, Bob took over Southeast Christian Church in 1966 at the age of 22. And he retired in 2006 at the age of 62. Um, and when he took over Southeast, uh, Southeast was a church of 250 people. When he left Southeast, it was 25,000 people. Uh, today, almost 20 years later, it's over 40,000 people. It's the fourth largest church in the United States. And Bob has impacted hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives through his ministry. And is just one of the most grace-filled presences I've ever been around. At 80 years old, he's still got it. He's still got it. He still has this, this unbelievable 
like knowledge of the scriptures and and connection with Jesus and other people. It's just incredible. It's incredible. And much of his success, I don't I'm just saying much of his success uh, is not due to his great personality. Uh, much of his success is due to his great commitment to being with Jesus uh, and keeping pace and rhythm, even as the demands of life and ministry got really, really big and really, really hard. And so um, that's a guy that I look at. And I'm like, well, I guess you can take a nap every day and still be pretty successful. You can still do a good job. And so if you're worried, like, you, if, you can do it. You can do it. it. Accept the invitation. Accept the invitation. Put it up. Block it off on your calendar so no one can book you during that time or whatever. But just accept the invitation. Get some rest. Um, the other thing is eat well. Eat well. You don't have to eat a lot. I think that that's... Uh, when we when we think about eating and, and taking in a lot of food, we don't we don't have to eat a lot, but we do need to eat probably better and more healthily. And I know some of y'all are like, why am I hearing this at church, right? Like, um, again, because these are our human limitations, and for God to take us deeper into places of the Spirit, we have to deal with our human limitations. And so, eat well. Try and eat as good as you can, um, and and um, stay as healthy as you can. Try not to just chalk up every meal to a fast food. I know sometimes it's life gets that way and you got to, right? But but try to have some good good meals um throughout the week. Um also I uh I wrote a blog this week um and it's on our website. We'll we'll send you guys a link to it tomorrow if you want to venture a little bit deeper. Uh you don't have to. Uh I promise you there's nothing life altering or life shattering there. Um because I wrote it. Um and so but uh, but but it's it's just I, I wrote a blog. Basically, it's called Nine Things That Leave You Dangerously Tired, and uh, there there are just nine things that I identified that um, will leave you dangerously tired um, if you're not paying attention, and you might not be able to identify them uh, as as easily as some other things. Like it's not just like oh your kids are crazy uh, and wake up at four a.m. Uh, so it's not it's not that kind of stuff. It's other stuff. Um, and uh, but here's the thing is my hope is that if you read that, maybe you'll resonate and identify with a couple of those things and um, and, and maybe be able to venture into solitude with what is and where you are, be able to name it and be honest before God with that stuff. Does that make sense? Um, that's that's really my hope. Um, and so that's that's why I wrote it. And so uh, feel free to use it as a resource. Uh, lastly, we do uh, have the solitude practice that we're going to be going through in our life groups. And so when you leave here today, we have some solitude companion guides to help you practice solitude. But we'd encourage you to do this in a group, right? Where our, our, our spiritual transformation is for the sake of others, which means it, it comes in the context of community. Uh, it can't just happen as individuals. So I encourage you, get into a group. This would be a great time to join one. Everybody's starting something new this week. So, so get into a group and, uh, and start to practice this with some other people. And uh, it'll also help you stay accountable to practicing it and, uh, and those sorts of things. So this is a, this is a really uh, important. So, but we'll give everybody that we can until we run out a companion guide just for being here today. And uh, if you want to do it, try and do it on your own. That's fine. But we encourage you to do this in a group. All right. Do this in a group of people. Uh, you can find all of our groups online. Um, so that's, that's uh, basically all the next steps. But we are going to do something a little bit different now. Okay. Um, a, a big part of solitude um, is quiet. Is being in the quiet place. And so we're going to just take like five minutes right now as a church. And we're just going to sit in silence together. Um, and we're just going to let God be with us as we are. And maybe you have something honestly uh, of, of where you are. Maybe you can identify that really well. And just be with God where you're at. And, and let this be a quiet place where he can give you rest. All right? So let's just be still. <laughs> 